my style was natural. I was blessed with the gift of timing. There was an elegance that people seemed to enjoy. Sometimes called a bit casual, but that belies what goes on underneath. There was nobody more pleasing on the eye than David Gow in full flow. I've never seen anyone time the ball as well as him without putting the effort in to, to get it to the boundary. And I remember thinking, wow, this is uh, it's something else. It was the time, you see, the time that he had. The best English batsman I've played with, wonderful to watch, a destroyer of high-class bowling. naturally aggressive player, uh, naturally liked to play his shots. Elegant, he scored runs quickly. Good to watch, and that was never going. He was uh, poetry in motion on lots of occasions. That first time you walk out to bat in a test match, you, there are a few butterflies around in your stomach. The best way to calm those butterflies is to get a long hop from a medium pacer, which um, on any good day you'll put away for four. I had a, a sort of moment's doubt, thought, you know, should I have done that? First ball in test cricket, shouldn't I just block it? But actually, you know, a bad ball is a bad ball. And my philosophy for the rest of my career was if you do see a bad ball, uh, you do try and hit it. A half century on his debut against Pakistan in 1978 announced David Gower's arrival in test cricket. Just three years earlier, he had been taken under the wing of a former England captain. Very, very talented young man. He uh, was 17, I think, when I first got hold of him at Leicester. A little bit of a scatterbrain, somebody had just come from school. Very easy going. We had to try and push him a bit on discipline. The points that Ray was making, albeit in a slightly infuriated way, but look, you know, you've got a lot of talent, but if you want to get anywhere with that talent, you've got to actually start just doing a bit of this and focusing on that and working a bit harder and getting to bed at night. That was when I guess I started to take it seriously. Um, and over the next couple of years, the process was in the hands of the club of Leicestershire and then of Ray Illingworth to try and turn me from being a gifted amateur into, if possible, a gifted professional. Gower's success in his first year as a test player was testament to the work Ray Illingworth and Leicestershire had put into improving his game. He played against Pakistan in 78. I played against New Zealand at the back end of that season. But immediately you notice the, the quality of the player that he was. He probably one of the best touch players um, that I've ever seen play the game. I loved that first summer. Um, you know, there were runs against Pakistan, runs against New Zealand, 100 against New Zealand at the Oval. It was still a stage in my career where I still felt a little bit like a, you know, a bit of a schoolboy. Um, still felt very young. Um, you know, 21 is that sort of age where you're still enjoying the fact you're playing cricket for the simple fact you're playing cricket. That was when you really appreciate the time that someone else has because they're playing the same, you know, you're in the same game as them actually, you don't feel part of it, but you are playing the same game and it was as if you weren't, I mean, it was, it was remarkable. David Gower had taken to international cricket with consummate ease, something he was keen to demonstrate during the visit of India in the summer of 1979. I had one of those conversations that sort of pings back into your mind later on with Chris Old. Um, and Chris just said to me one day, you're going to get a double hundred soon. Or where's that effect? Because you know, I was thinking, well, you know, how do I progress my game? How do I go from making sort of 50s and 60s, which is what I was doing, uh, the odd hundred? How do, I, you know, how do I go to that next stage? David wasn't a huge physical specimen, and it showed that he didn't have to be a powerhouse to be able to play attractive cricket shots and uh, his ability particularly off the back foot to pick up the pace of the ball and just caress it around the cricket ground was one of the most pleasing sights in cricket history. It was an edge that got the 200 uh, but by then the field had spread there weren't exactly five slips waiting for it so you kind of make your own luck there and up goes the bat you acknowledge the crowd as normal and you thought yeah someone said I was going to do that one day and now I've done it. Despite a dip in form during the early 80s, Gower was rewarded with the vice captaincy in 1982, having turned down an approach to go on a rebel tour to South Africa. 
Peter May, the chairman of selectors, didn't think David was ready. So the, uh, the needle spun round to me, but I think it was always thought that David would certainly be the, the next England captain, and, and so it proved. As soon as you're appointed, you know, the world does change, um, because now you have that entire responsibility for what happens on the field, for what happens off the field, um, the things you have to deal with, you're not really prepared for, to be honest. When Gower became captain in 1984, his role would come under immediate scrutiny as England faced a West Indies side that hadn't lost a test series in four years. As a batsman, I found it tough. As a captain, I found it almost impossible. You've got to say all the right things. You've got to believe all the right things. And you've got to stand up in front of your team and say, right, this is how we're going to try and beat the West Indies. Now, your heart tells you one thing, your head tells you something very similar. Much though you'd love to beat a side like that, and much though you do all the right things that you possibly can to work out how to do it, the simple truth is they were a better side. He would be haunted by a decision in the second test. We declared at Lord's on the final day, and still lost by nine wickets, whatever it was, uh, with about 11, 12, 14 overs to spare at the end of the day. It was a horrible day. It was the brilliance of Gordon Greenwich that rather denied us that. But. Overall, the one overriding memory is that the West Indies were a better side. If you think they've, they've had that hideous series, they got to India, Indira Gandhi's assassinated, Percy Norris, the British High Commissioner in, in Mumbai, is assassinated, all before they bowled a ball in a test match. So it's obviously a testing tour, but we came out at the end of it all with a win in the test series. So that was a proud moment for me. He and uh, Mike Gatting and Graham Fowler, um, you know, engineered that to. Uh, 2-1 win in India, that was a, a real highlight for David. To come back and win that series was phenomenal, done with some, with, with, yeah, actually with David's leadership, um, great team spirit, some of the you know, wonderful characters, um, and they wouldn't have done it without that. So actually, I thought that you know, anyone was going to lose so I his five nil in the, the mid-80s, but to go to India and win was a phenomenal achievement. Returning from India on a high, the summer of 1985 would see David Gower elevated to national hero status when England faced Australia for the Ashes. I think we had a, a certain amount of confidence after the winter and the win in India, but you always start afresh. And it was, I thought it was a great series uh, in many, many ways. One all after two, so, you know, a contest is established, and then a couple of draws on good pitches, and then it got interesting. With one century to his name already in the series, England's captain led by example with the bat in the fifth test at Edgbaston. I always went on the balcony when he went into bat. And I, it just, I just enjoyed it. That, and I don't think you could be anything else. It was glorious to watch. His timing was superb. Um, when you're doing well individually and you're doing well as a team, but you're leading the team as well, there's no better feeling. You just feel on top of the world. Double hundreds are always welcome. Um, I didn't make many in my career. Uh, to make one in an Ashes Test match and at good speed and in the circumstances where we need to make those runs quickly and needed to pile them on um, was all good news. Gower's double century helped England to victory by an innings and 118 runs. If they avoided defeat in the final test, the Ashes would be returning to England. You know you have to draw to take the Ashes. Obviously, to win would be ideal. Win the toss, good news. Bat first, good news. Get runs yourself, even better news. Uh, and that was one of my special nights, 150-odd against the Aussies at the Oval under those circumstances as captain. That felt brilliant. Then we got to the stage a couple of days later where we couldn't force the follow-on, and lots of people in that side were saying, well, if we bat again, we can bat them out of the game. We can be absolutely safe. We were on a roll, so I took that decision to bowl again to enforce that follow-on, and we won by an inning. So that was the absolute cream, the absolute icing on the cake. Um, and then the rains came, so you know, we just timed it beautifully. To win the Ashes in England, uh, with, with only quite a reasonable side, you know, that was, I would say, his crowning glory. To beat uh, an Australian side so convincingly and perform so well himself uh, must have given him immense satisfaction and crushing the old enemy, really rubbing their noses in the dirt, uh, it was terrific. That summer for me was the absolute ideal of success as a captain, success as a batsman, and you know, when you combine the two, that is perfect.
What about the West Indies in January? I'm sure they'll be quaking in their boots at the moment. It was said very dryly, it wasn't said seriously, but um, West Indies cricket was still incredibly strong. Um, and if I said that, it was done not to predict that we're going to do great things in the West Indies, but well, I, I was hoping we'd do better than 84. The West Indies were very, very ruthless in the cricket that they played. Viv Richards got them together as a unit and um, really gave the opposition a, a working over and they just wanted to prove to everyone that how, how good a side they were. And it was one of those tours where, um, without going over every little incident or every major incident, to be honest, um, we came second by a distance. We got totally outplayed and no one performed well throughout that series. And we, we struggled to bowl them out. Um, and we struggled to score runs against them. There were obviously comments about my captaincy, about my leadership, about all sorts of things. Um, and the selectors understood something, I think, of the trauma, something of the problem, I, the West Indies, still being very strong. And they gave me one game to do against India at the start of that series. So they appointed me back for one game only. So not exactly a vote of confidence. In typical Gower fashion, he quickly made light of the situation. Just to try and emphasize the point, I had t-shirts printed up for every man in the squad. I had one for myself printed, I'm in charge, and the rest, the other 11, 12, had just said, I'm not. Um, and I dare say I probably had a, a little bit of a hand in this myself, but things did not go well. You end up losing that first test match. And uh, I mean, we, yeah, things just didn't go our way. Um, and at the end of the game, I handed over the t-shirt which said, I'm in charge to Mike Gatting, who within minutes of the game finishing had been appointed a new captain. But I got to a stage where I started to think I needed a rest. When your dreams basically are being shattered, um, it's tough emotionally. And this, this is the thing that never quite leaves you, to be honest. Um, you know, to be captaining England, as I said before, is great when it's going right. It's a beautiful thing when it's going well. Um, when it's going horribly wrong, then it's a mighty tough time and you do feel um, very, very isolated. Despite a century in Perth at the end of the year, Gower found little joy from cricket during that winter's ashes and was pulled through only by his friendship with two of England's biggest characters. Well, I suppose both them, Lamb, Gow, are known as the champagne uh, set. You know, David did enjoy his bottles of Bollinger, particularly if someone else was buying them for him. They all enjoyed their wine quite a bit. Uh, we used to go out, and you never got bothered that much. It, it wasn't too bad, but to, to find a decent wine bar, Gow would be right along behind both of them, and Lammy was always there. He was a bit of a playboy off the, off the field, nothing like in the same uh, bracket as uh, Ian, but uh, he certainly enjoyed himself, uh, lived life to the full, um, engaging company, but... Uh, you had to have a few quid in your pocket if you wanted to go out with David. He'd be out late at night, he'd be driving fancy cars and knocking around with women. But he was also tall, a handsome man. You know, albeit rather boyish, his curly hair. That was a little bit of a problem with David. He turned up one morning with a brown shoe and a black shoe. And I did say to him, uh, uh, we're in a hurry again this morning, David, late night. He said, why, why is that, Captain? I said, well, have you looked down at your feet yet? Oh, well, I didn't draw the curtains back, he said. And, uh, but. I give him his due, we played the next match down at Somerset and I was having breakfast and who walked past but David Gower in the jacket, everything, absolutely immaculate. Said, this all right, Captain? I said, you've just bloody come in. <laughs> so that was the sort of bloke he was. He